Rings, romance isn't that important. Which is kind of crazy, because modern fantasy is romance obsessed. A glance at the fantasy bestsellers list, or a quick scroll through book talk, shows you that modern fantasy novels practically can't sell without some hint of romance or sex. But The Lord of the Rings was able to gain worldwide acclaim with barely a hint of romantic love. And looking into how and why Tolkien wrote romance the way that he did teaches us a lot about him and the genre of fantasy as a whole. I'm Jess, part-time hobbit, and today I'm going to take you on a brief stroll through romance in Tolkien's works, with a specific focus on the love story of Aragorn and Arwen. Unlike in the movies, the books don't tell this romance as part of the primary plotline, instead reserving it for the appendix of The Return of the King. And it all begins with Aragorn, son of Arathorn. Arathorn was the chieftain of the Dúnedain rangers, but he was tragically slain by orcs while Aragorn was still very young. Arathorn and his family had always been close to Elrond, the Lord of Rivendell, so following his death, Aragorn and his mother both went to live in Rivendell with the elves. Elrond takes special care of the two of them while they're in Rivendell, and Aragorn comes to see him as a kind of replacement father figure. However, Elrond was keeping a secret from Aragorn, his heritage and his role as the future king of Gondor. They even kept his true name from him, instead calling him Estel, which means hope. Perhaps because his identity was kept secret from him, Aragorn grew up strong and well adjusted, wise in the secret and ancient ways of the elves. Elrond is keeping an eye on Aragorn, so when he sees what a, a wise young man he's become, he tells Aragorn of his true name and his destiny. Aragorn accepts this readily, deciding that he is going to work tirelessly to become worthy of the throne of Gondor. And just the next day, his life would be further altered forever. Aragorn walked alone in the woods, and his heart was high within him. And suddenly, even as he sang, he saw a maiden walking on a greensward among the white stems of birches, and he halted, amazed, thinking that he had strayed into a dream. The song that Aragorn was singing was the mythic tale of Beren and Luthien, and he sang of their first meeting, when the human warrior Beren stumbled across the beautiful elven maid Luthien dancing in the forest. Aragorn's own reality so closely echoes the ancient tale that he calls out to Nuviel, the elven word for nightingale, which Beren had once called Luthien. Arwen is confused, but not displeased, and she asks why he's calling her that name. And Aragorn tells her that if she is not Luthien reincarnated, then she looks exactly like the immortal elven beauty. Arwen tells him that she's not Luthien, but predicts that she may end up following the same path as her. In that instant, Arwen has the foresight to know that she, just like Luthien, will fall in love with this all-too-mortal man. This kind of wisdom is unsurprising, considering that at the time she was over 2,700 years old. And yeah, the, the age gap there is a little bit, uh, but it's fantasy, so it's, uh, it's, it's fine? Besides, Arwen wasn't even around in Rivendell when Aragorn was an actual baby, because she had spent the last couple of years in Lothlorien with her grandmother, Galadriel. Being an immortal elf, Arwen doesn't look her age. Aragorn was unabashed, for he saw the elven light in her eyes and the wisdom of many days. Yet, from that hour, he loved Arwen Undomiel daughter of Elrond. However instantly smitten the two are, Aragorn's mother is quick to point out that a union between the two of them may be unwise. An elf hadn't married a mortal man since the days of Beren and Luthien, and Elrond likewise steps in to voice his disapproval. He explains that love will only distract Aragorn from his great purpose, and insists that he mustn't marry until he's already ascended the throne. He also specifically says that Arwen is not an option because of of her age, and because she's already planned to leave Middle-earth for Valinor with Elrond rather than dying in Middle-earth. Aragorn accepts this, but kind of holds on to his hope, recalling the trials that Beren had to go through in order to win the hand of Luthien. With this secret hope inside him, he leaves Rivendell, determined to make something of himself. Aragorn wanders the pathways and forests and cities of Middle-earth for 30 years, testing his skills of both survival and 
and battle. And during this time away from Rivendell, he becomes acquainted with the Rohirrim of Rohan and befriends the wizard Gandalf the Grey. These years were a crucial time, a sort of crucible that took him from this soft elven raised boy to a world hardened ranger. At the age of 49, 30 years after he'd last seen her, his paths cross with Arwen again in Lothlorien. And instantly, they both know that their love has been utterly untouched by time and distance. And thus it was that Arwen first beheld him again after their long parting. And as he came walking towards her under the trees of Caras Galadon laden with flowers of gold, her choice was made and her doom appointed. That reunion was all it took for Arwen to forsake her immortal life and be with Aragorn until old age took them both. Though they couldn't marry until Aragorn took the throne, just like Elrond had said, they promised themselves to each other there at the hill of Cedden Amroth. Their love remains completely untarnished, even when they're separated from each other during the events of the Lord of the Rings. Aragorn is mightily tested by the love of Eowyn, the shield maiden of Rohan, but he remains steadfastly dedicated to his elven maid. Then, finally, following the destruction of the ring and Aragorn's coronation, Aragorn, the King Elisar, wedded Arwen Undomiel in the City of Kings upon the day of Midsummer, and the tale of their long waiting and labors was come to fulfillment. Arwen and Aragorn ruled as the King and Queen of Gondor for many beautiful years, having a son named Eldarion together, as well as several daughters. Arwen would remain in Middle-earth even after her father had passed on, giving Frodo her spot on the boat to heaven. After many long and good years of rulership, Ship, Aragorn realized that the time of his death was near, and he gave his crown to his son Eldarion and said farewell to his daughters. Arwen was at his side when he passed on, old age and frailty, finally taking the king of Gondor. And long there he lay, an image of splendor of the kings of men, in glory undimmed, before the breaking of the world. Arwen would never truly be able to recover from the loss of Aragorn, and she left Gondor soon after his death, instead traveling to Lothlorien. Since Galadriel and all of the elves had long since left, the sanctuary of Arwen's youth stood empty the golden trees fading. There at last, when the Malorn leaves were falling, but spring had not yet come, she laid herself upon Cedden Amroth, and there is her green grave. Arwen died of grief without Aragorn, upon the very spot that they had promised themselves to each other all those long years before. This love story is fairly simple and straightforward, but it becomes so much richer when you look into Tolkien's own life. Tolkien was also left fatherless at a young age, and he and his family were taken under the protection of a family friend and Catholic priest, Father Francis. Tolkien's mother would also die when he was very young, leaving his brother to be his only immediate family, and his entire childhood was just permeated by this loss and loneliness. When he was 16 years old, Tolkien was placed by Father Francis into a boarding house where he met Edith Bratt. 19 years old at the time and an orphan just like him, Edith seemed kind of like the perfect match for Tolkien. In a letter to her, he reminisces about good nights when sometimes you were in your little white nightgown and our absurd long window talks and how we watch the sun come up over town through the mist and Big Ben toll hour after hour and the moths almost used to frighten you away and our whistle call, and our cycle rides, and the fire talks, and the three great kisses. Their love felt uh, unstoppable and clandestine, something out of the pages of a fairy tale. This whirlwind of a romance was put to a stop by Father Francis, who, just like Elrond, recognized that Edith was older than Tolkien. Although I will say that a, a three-year age gap feels like nothing compared to, um, like 2,680 years, and he thought that romance would hold the young man back from his potential. Though he may not have been, you know, ascending the throne of Gondor, Tolkien was trying to get admitted into Oxford University, a task that 
probably seemed almost as hard at times. He'd already failed the entrance exam once, and Father Francis believed that it was because his mind was on Edith and not his education. In order to keep him focused, the priest banned Tolkien from seeing or writing to or speaking to Edith at all until he had turned 21 years old and was no longer under Father Francis's legal care. Though brokenhearted, Tolkien was mostly obedient and committed himself fully to his studies, eventually being admitted to Oxford and beginning his educational journey. And then, on the day he turned 21, he wrote to Edith. However, much to his surprise, in the time that they'd been apart, it seemed that Edith had moved on and became engaged to another man. Despite the engagement, though, she agreed to meet up so that they could talk. They spent an afternoon together, and that was all it took. Edith broke off her engagement entirely, and they promised themselves to each other once more. Not everything was perfect, though, and the issue of faith in particular loomed over the two of them. Tolkien was an incredibly devout Catholic, but Edith was Anglican. Edith was eventually convinced to convert for him, but she never really seemed happy with that choice for the rest of her life, not finding the kind of community that she was looking for in Catholicism. And yet, like Arwen, she had chosen to give up her original goals and desires for her soulmate and would remain steadfast in that conviction. Despite their faith troubles, as well as the interference of the First World War, Edith and Tolkien would remain steadfastly and determinedly in love for the rest of their lives. Now, of course, it would be wrong to assume that um, Aragorn and Arwen were a one-to-one -one representation of the Tolkien's in Middle-earth, because Tolkien just really didn't like the idea of exact allegory. However, it's kind of hard to ignore the similarities, and I think it's pretty safe to assume that this one great love story that he included in The Lord of the Rings was based off of the love that he knew best, his own. And this love, for, for lack of a better term, is surprisingly unpassionate. It's not fiery or, or lustful or aggressive. It's the kind of love that consists of choices. In a letter to his son Christopher, Tolkien wrote, No man, however truly he loved his betrothed and bride as a young man, has lived faithfully to her as a wife in mind and body without the deliberate and conscious exercise of the will. Now, I don't know about you, but the, um, deliberate and conscious exercise of the will doesn't exactly give me butterflies. But that's intentional. Tolkien goes on to explain that love born only from passion just won't last. When the glamour wears off, or merely works a bit thin, they think they've made a mistake and that the real soulmate is still to find. His greatest and most romantic love stories are about two people that found each other, fell in love, and then continued to stay in love for the rest of their lives. This is a stark contrast to modern romance, which really loves to focus on the falling in love part. They revel in the, the will they, won't they tension, the fighting and the making up, the, the final passionate kiss when they finally decide, screw it, we're giving this thing a go. However, these modern romances tend to stop there. Once the couple is like, you know, together, they just, fade to black. They just give you this, this vague happily ever after. So if modern romances are about falling in love, then Tolkien's romance is about staying in love. Of course, I, I do think that there is room for both of these types of love in literature. However, if all of the media that you're taking in and all of the things you're learning about love are just about the falling in love stage, what are you supposed to do once you want to stay in love? And listen, I am all for falling in love. I mean, I've spent most of my life just living for that thrill. And I think most people do, for a time at least. Falling in love can be bright and fiery and tense and fun. But when I started to get sick of that, when I got a little too tired and a little too broken-hearted to do that for now, I'm very, very glad that I had the basis of Tolkien's love to come back to. The kind of love where you look into a person's eyes and agree to love each other for as long as you can. The kind of love that Tolkien spoke about when he wrote about his life with Edith. Young we are, and yet have stood like planted hearts in the great sun of love for so long, that we have become as one, deep-rooted in the soil of life and tangled in sweet growth. 
Of course, romantic love is far from the only type of love that we get to see in Tolkien's works. In fact, I'd say he places far more emphasis on the love of friends and family and oneself. So whatever your relationship is with Valentine's Day or whatever you're doing for Valentine's Day this year, I hope you take a second to just think about and cherish the love in your life. If you got to this point of the video, you should probably just take a second to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to join me here for a video every week. Let me know in the comments what your favorite Tolkien love story is, because I personally am a huge fan of Baron and Luthien, but I would love to hear some arguments for these other couples, so, uh, you know, try and change my mind. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, happy Valentine's Day, I love you all, and I hope that you all have a very happy hobbity day.